she mentioned Michael Wilson, he's our intern. Um, for those of you who were on that tour of the library space yesterday, when we passed through the future library Carroll area, you saw Michael Hurd at work on yet another archival project. Um, so he's, he's been with us since October, so he's actually had quite a long internship with us. Um, he couldn't be here this morning because he has another job for the Center County Historical Society, so that's where he is this morning. Um, but he did a lot of the work in helping me put these slides together, so I wanted to, and not to mention processing these collections, so I wanted to be sure to give him credit. So the, the first collection I'm going to talk about is the really big one, the Thomas Alexander Papers. Um, and what you see here is the cover sheet of the Finding Aid, which will be up on our website and available for you to take a look at very soon. So this story actually began the previous April, April 2013. I went to St. Louis to the uh, United States Philatelic Classic Society meeting. Um, you recognize the arch here. For anyone who was at that show in St. Louis, St. Louis did not look like this. It was covered in a foot of snow. <laughs> we were trapped in the hotel. Um, but I, I went, and uh, before the big snowstorm, I met with the Classic Society board, and we talked about uh, Tom Alexander donating his papers to the APRL. Um, some of the members of the Classic Society met with Tom, um, and, and I gave a presentation to the Classic Society, and they then relayed that to Tom about the kind of facility we had, the kind of protection that we could offer uh, his materials, and the way that we would make them accessible to future researchers. Um, so there are a lot of factors that came together here. Um, first of all, Tom's willingness to donate his papers um, and to do so while he's still around and can be active uh, part of that process. You know, a lot of times we don't get to papers until they're part of an estate and a family knows <coughs> where they are. And, you know, we may be losing a lot of valuable material that's just getting recycled or going into a dumpster because the family doesn't realize what they have. So, this is a really good example of involving somebody while they're still active in the hobby um, so we can work with them to preserve their valuable material. And then the Classic Society having the foresight to work with Tom on this and not only to help facilitate the donation but to realize that when a donation comes to a library, it's not free. The material may be free, but there's a lot of work and material involved in preserving the collection and making it available to researchers. Um, as Michael could tell you in great detail. <laughs> um, and then the APRL board um, for putting in place a policy um, that we would be proactive in going after this kind of material and preserving it because we feel that the APRL is the place to do that. So that was April. Now this is uh, John, John Morris and Jim Allen um, from the Classic Society board. And they are working, I believe they're actually either inside the storage locker or inside the tractor trailer, um, loading up, I think it was 326 boxes in total of Tom Alexander's uh, papers and also uh, parts of his library. So they got books, journals, and auction catalogs as well. Um, so this was June, I believe they spent two weeks um, doing kind of a rough sort of this material, which was really helpful. So when the boxes got to Belmont, we knew basically which ones contained books, journals, auction catalogs, and then uh, archival research material. Then July of 2013, um, you'll recognize this is Sunman Hall. Um, a tractor trailer pulled up to the APS. We knew it was coming. <laughs> a tractor trailer pulled up, unloaded, I, I forget how many pallets. We, Ken and I were trying to remember yesterday, it was eight or 12, it, it was a lot of stuff. Um, so we, brought all the pallets into Sunman Hall, untrained wrapped them, got the boxes off the pallets because we couldn't take the pallets upstairs. Um, then you see some of the APS staff, it was pretty much all hands on deck, on deck. everybody came in in blue jeans and got ready to work. Um, you see Bill Grayson and Tom Horn and Scott Tiffany up there helping out. Um, so we had people brought their kids in to help, it was great. <laughs> so we unloaded all the boxes, got them on book carts, took them on the elevator upstairs um, because we wanted to get them as close to where we were going to be doing the processing as possible. So they all went up to um, second floor of building four. 
And this is when we had the glasses upstairs and um, took a little peek inside for a photo album. So then in October, we were finally able to <coughs> hire an intern. Um, so this is Michael, Michael Wilson, um, working upstairs in building 4-2. Um, so the Classic Society um, got a grant from the David T. Beals Three Charitable Trust. Um, so that's what funded the majority of the work for this project. Um, we were able to buy this computer for Michael to work on. Um, we bought all of the archival boxes, archival folders, decertification spray, everything that we needed to make sure that uh, this material would be preserved. So January 2014, we finally, um, Michael had been working for October, November, December, January, four months. Uh, first thing he did was take out all of the published material. When we process an archival collection, uh, the general principle is to remove any published material and put it into the library collection so that it, it can be accessible. Um, and then we include a bibliography of all that material with the uh, archival finding aid. So when you look at the finding guide, when we get it up on the website, um, you'll see a, a very lengthy bibliography at the end of all of the books, journals, auction catalogs that we removed from these archival boxes. And that doesn't even include the library part of the donation, um, which has already been assimilated into the library catalog. So you may pull a book off the shelf, open it up, and see a book plate that says donated by Thomas J. Alexander. Um, so that means it was part of this donation. So this is an archival box and an archival file folder. So he had to take everything out of the containers that it was in and put it in these special archival containers. Um, and for those of you who haven't worked with archival collections, the reason we do this is that um, paper that has acid in it, um, over time it, it breaks down, becomes more acidic, and it becomes brittle. Um, so if you've ever taken a book and you, you know, bend one of the pages and it just comes right off, that means that the paper is brittle. Um, and actually sometimes, Older paper is less acidic. It's a higher quality paper, so so you know you pick up something from mid 1800s and it could be in great shape. You pick up something from 1940 and it's just completely falling apart and disintegrating in your hands. As anyone who's tried to uh, use the lens in the library knows, you see little bits of paper all over the floor. So that's what we're trying to prevent in doing this. Um, Paper is fairly easy to deal with. We also had um, in some of these collections, photographs, slides, negatives. As we discovered yesterday, three and a half inch floppy disks. Um, so anything that's, that's not paper presents another challenge for us. So we have to figure out how to deal with those. So we got um, special boxes for preserving slides. Um, we got tissue paper to interleave the photos to pre prevent them from sticking together. Um, floppy disk. Luckily, uh, we still have quite a few old computers here at the ADS. We were able to find somebody's computer to put that in, uh, read the file. Um, luckily, it was a .doc file, so we could still open it up. You know, you put in one of those disks, and you just never know what kind of file extension you're going to see, whether you're going to be able to open it. Um, but we were able to open it and, and print it out and preserve that. So then in February 2014, we were finally ready to start putting the boxes on the shelves. You see here, um, Michael had labeled them with post-it notes because he didn't want to print the labels until we were sure that we had everything right. And it's a good thing we did this because somewhere somewhere in the middle around box number 160, we got one box number off. So <laughs> he had to really redo all of them. But luckily, they were just post-it notes at that point. Um, and then he worked with Betsy Gamble, our technical services coordinator to free up room on the shelves for these 250 archival boxes. So April 2014, here are, um, this isn't all the boxes, but here are a lot of the boxes um, labeled and up on the compact shelving upstairs. And if anybody uh, didn't get to go on the library tour yesterday and would like to see the library space, um, I'm sure Ken or I would be happy to do another tour at some point this week. So now I'm going to show you a few things from inside those boxes. Um, so there are quite a few of these sheets, um, and you may not be able to see them too well. It's kind of small, but these are cards designed by Creighton Hart, and so this is recording information about the cover that you see at the bottom. Can we cut this day? 
I'm sorry? The cover is there. It's not, no, it's, it's an image of the cover. It's not the actual cover. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah for, for the most part of these collections, there isn't any philatelic material, um, but with some exceptions. But for the most part, we have uh, photocopies, photographs, scans, slides, negatives, um, you know, information about the material, but not, not the actual philatelic material itself. You know, people walk, people who don't know the hobby walk into the library and they say, oh, you have a whole library of stamps? It's no. Books about stamps, not stamps. Um, so these are some of Tom's notes. Um, we have notebooks and um, files full of notes. And you can see some of it was done on the computer and then um, he has notations. Um, this is an exhibit, I forgot to bring my notes over with me this morning. Um, this is an exhibit by Clinton, I've seen Kanaga and Kanaka, both he was a Kansas City stamp collector. Um, so you can see that again, philatelic material has been removed, um, but the newspaper clipping is still here in the information. Um, and there should, usually there's enough information that you can figure out what it's referring to, but unfortunately that material's been removed from the exhibit. Um, so, one of the challenging things, um, and you know, one of the reasons we really wanted this collection, but one of the challenging things in processing this collection is that it's not just Tom Alexander's stuff. He had um, material from many different researchers that he had acquired and collected. Um, so as we're going through this material, you know, Michael's trying to figure out, is this Tom Alexander's handwriting? Is this Craig Hart? Is this Wilson Hume? Is this uh, Henry Meyer? So there, there were quite a few um, he kind of became a little bit of a handwriting expert. You know, he told me, I feel like I'm getting to know these people going through this. <laughs> um, this is a post office ledger that was included in the collection. So um, this is a, a fairly large ledger, so we had to get a special box to put this in. Um, but this was, I think the postmaster's name was Matur Maternin. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot my notes. Um, it's early morning. <laughs> but uh, so this is not actually um, accounting of the post office. This is weather data. So you just never know what you're going to find. <laughs> and I think this was after he was a postmaster in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, but this, by the date on this, 1871, we think this is actually after he moved to Iowa, uh, moved onto a farm, and he later became a pretty prominent state politician in Iowa, but he was recording the daily, um, not just the temperature, but all kinds of things about the weather. And this is a page from the actual uh, postmaster's accounting in Worcester, Massachusetts. And this is obviously not philatelic material. So we, so we did come across quite a bit of stuff. Um, Tom has very wide-ranging interests. Um, so all kinds of historical material, um, and you, know, you can see we've got this uh, kind of fiction image here, um, but this was a murder that took place in Missouri, um, and we're not sure if these are Tom's notes or somebody else's, but there are all these handwritten notes about the murder case and the trial. So that's, that's kind of a very broad overview of the uh, Tom Alexander papers, which is, you know, just a huge collection. I could probably go on for a full hour about that. Um, but I wanted to, to show you some of the other collections that we have. Um, so this is the W. Wallace Cleveland papers. Um, this is another donation that came to us recently. And um, this one we worked with the United States Stamp Society. So this is another society that's um, been very helpful in um, assisting us with acquiring and funding the processing of archival collections. Um, so this collection actually came to us as an estate. It was donated by uh, Wallace Cleveland's family. And the United States Stamp Society uh, paid for shipping the material and uh, paid to extend Michael's internship so that he could work on processing this collection. So again, this is uh, the, the front page of the finding guide, which will be available on our website soon. We only just finished this, and I sent it to the um, United States Fan Society for review, so that's why it's not quite available yet. 
Um, so Wallace Cleveland was a plate number specialist. Um, he did the Durland plate number catalog for a number of years. Um, so that's this this collection is a lot more focused. It's not anywhere near as rambling and uh, broad as the Tom Alexander collection. Um, but this is uh, some of his typed notes. And then we have lots of handwritten notes. So we don't spend as much time because that, that collection is a lot more focused, and, and it was also a lot smaller. I think uh, it was 20, 22 boxes or 32 boxes when it originally came to us, so still not, not a small collection. And, um, I think Michael spent about a month going through that collection. Um, and this is the Richard Graham papers. I'm not showing you the front page of a finding guide because Michael is still working on it. Um, so if you go up and see him this week, that, this is what he'll be working on. Um, this, this collection, the Richard Brand papers, actually came to us well before either the Alexander or the Cleveland donation. Um, and it, we worked with um, Dick Graham's son um, out in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and he, he was kind of shipping material to us piecemeal as he was going through his dad's stuff. Um, so I think... The Cleveland must have been 22 boxes. This one was 32 boxes, and we may still be getting material. Um, it, like I said, it's kind of coming to us in pieces. But you know, we created a brief record for it, and we put it up upstairs in the compact shelving. But that was the extent of what we were able to do because we just didn't have the staff time, and we didn't have a volunteer who was available to go through a collection this big. Um, so. We were really excited when the Classic Society decided that they would fund um, this project as well, so we were able to extend Michael's internship yet again. Eventually, he's going to you know, finish his school and get a real job and we'll lose it, but <laughs> until then, we're taking full advantage. Um, so he's working on this, and what, you're, what you see here is our brief record in the catalog. So, um, and this was, this was not done until the last few years. Um, we just put this procedure in place. So then when an archival collection comes in, the first thing we do, um, you know, as we're writing the acknowledgement letter to the donor or the family, is we make a record in the catalog so we know what we got, who it came from, when we got it, how much of it there is, and which shelf we put it on. <laughs> um, because for anyone who saw the old library annex when it was down at this end of the building on the first floor, we just had boxes and boxes and boxes that if we were lucky, it would have somebody's name scribbled on them. Um, and maybe there would be a note tucked inside giving us a clue as to what it was, but we just had so many boxes that we had no idea. Um, so when we moved material from the annex up to the new compact shelving, um, which we did a lot of during volunteer work week last year, um, not only, um, as anyone who was in there knows, we had to clean the boxes, but we also um, had people noting down if there was something scribbled on the side of the box, and we would create a little brief record like this so that if somebody said, you know, I'm looking for such and such collection that was donated to the APRL back in the 90s, we could search in the catalog and hopefully come up with a, a shelf location for that box. Um, so it's really challenging to go back and do this retrospectively, but we're doing it as much as we're able to. Um, but we're trying really hard for any new collections come, that come in to make sure that they're recorded properly so we know what we have. Because, and it, you know, one of the reasons we create finding guides for archival collections is, you know, they do sit on boxes, uh, on shelves in boxes. You have to ask for them. You have to come here to Belmont to use them. Um, so you really want to be able to, to look at a guide to that collection and see what's in it. You know, is it worth me making a trip to Belmont? Is it worth me paying for somebody to scan some material from one of the folders? Um, you need to you need to have a clue what's in it. So this, this is step one, and then the later step is the finding guide. Um, so Dick Graham wrote a postal history column for Linz for years. Um, so a big part of this collection um, is actual copies of his Linz articles. Now, of course, we have Linz in print. We have Linz on microfilm. Um, so we have all of these articles. However, um, as you probably know, Linz is not comprehensively indexed. Um, 
so this is the only place where we can look and see all of Dave Graham's columns. Um, so that, that's a really useful part of this donation, actually. And, you know, I was talking with his son, and he said, you know, I'm not sure how useful this is to you. And I said, well, not maybe the, the copies of the articles themselves, but just having the list, because there is a list of this of all of the articles that he published. So that's really helpful. And then the other cool thing that we have is, again, this isn't the actual cover, but this is a color photograph of the cover that's in this article. I don't know if you can see that um, from this far away. But this is, so this is Michael's matched up. Um, this image of the cover in color with the little black and white one that appeared in Lynn's. Um, so this is another one I think that was Civil War. This is World War II. And again, we have color images of the covers. Um, he also has a quite extensive photograph collection of people. Um, some of them are people who were pictured on stamps. Um, some of them were prominent philatelists. Uh, these are the Baker brothers, Hugh Baker and David Baker. Um, and some of them, we're not sure what the significance is, but luckily, they, uh, for the most part, they're identified um, and they're filed alphabetically. So I think that's been the, the bulk of the work for Michael with this collection is dealing with all these photos that were, um, for the most, some of them are just boxes of photos, <laughs> but some of them are actually filed in order, but they're just kind of stuck in a card file, so he's putting uh, interleaving tissue and putting them in appropriate containers. Um, so that's the, <clears throat> the Richard Graham papers, um, and we're still going through that one, so um, come back next year and maybe able to tell you more about that collection. Um, but this is this is the one collection that when I arrived here in 2010, we actually had a finding aid for. Um, there was a, a grant that funded having an archivist go through the Daniel Hines Airmail Aviation Papers. And this is a collection actually of local interest um, about early airmail, um, and a lot of it has to do. <clears throat> It's not just Belfont, but a lot of it does have to do with the airfield here in Belfont. Um, <clears throat> we have we have a few of the images scanned, and you can see uh, part of the collection uh, in that hallway. There's a little exhibit on airmail. <clears throat> so I thought this was kind of interesting. This is a black bear draped across this, <laughs> this airplane, very central Pennsylvania. Um, it's pilot Fred. Can't quite read the name and two hunters with a black bear, which was shot following a forced landing in Old County, Pennsylvania. <laughs> there are lots and lots of pictures of pilots, uh, airfield personnel, uh, airplanes, hangars, equipment, um, and there are also um, there's a manuscript of a book. Um, there are, there are actually artifacts, um, there are pilot's logs, there are all kinds of things in this collection. And we do actually have a finding guide that you can get to on our website. This is a photo of Jack Knight. Um, so another collection we have is the American First Day Cover Society Archives. Um, this is another collection that was here um, when I got here. Um, and the, the American First Day Cover Society actually um, still maintains this archive, so this is still a growing, living collection. Um, so what you see here is uh, part of the collection that we call the Scott Number Files. So these are files by Scott Number, um, and for the most part, what they have in them is just copies of First Day covers for that stamp issue. And again, they're just copies, they're not actual covers. For the most part, they're black and white photocopies, but there is some color in there. Um, I think increasingly we'll start to see color in there. Um, but Alison Cusick usually comes up a few times a year and works on growing this collection. Yeah. Where do you put the philatelic items that you have to find in an archive? For the most part, we don't. For the most part, we um, usually the archival collections that we get don't usually have actual philatelic material. Um, but, you know, we have had some exhibits donated to the library, 
um, still have the philatelic material. So what I what we do is usually make a color scan of the exhibit that we can put online and make available, and then I give the exhibit to Mercer over at Expertizing. So, and depending on what it is, uh, some things may get taken apart and sold, um, but other things still keep intact. So the answer is it depends. But you know, we have, we evaluate it. Anything that comes in, I go over and talk to Mercer. So the other part of the flash, um, and this is still from the Scott number files. Um, so you can see sometimes there are articles, and again. Um, I believe this is from Lens. So we have this in the library, um, but if it's not indexed, you would really have no way of knowing that this article existed um, unless a copy was stuck in this file. So even though it's, it kind of duplicates what we have in the library, it's still a useful part of the collection. Um, and sometimes we'll have a copy of a cover with somebody's notes about it. So the other part of the First Day Cover Society are kind of the cache maker files. Um, and, and this is what really gets a lot of heavy use when people are researching a cache maker and they're looking for biographical information or they're trying to identify a cache um, or trying to figure out the dates that somebody was working or who was working with them. Um, so this is, I believe, from the Leo August file. So again, we'll have copies of covers that the person made. Um, and you can see some handwritten notes on here, so somebody was obviously trying to figure out whether this was August or somebody else. Um, again, biograph biographical information. That, again, this is something that's New York Times. It's readily available, but you know, we don't keep New York Times in the APRL, so we wouldn't have this. Um, you know, if, if this copy were in here, you would have to somehow discover that this New York Times article existed and then figure out where you can get access to Again, not that hard, but it's just one more step in your research. So it's really nice to have this stuff collected here. Um, another very different type of collection that we have, we have um, two rather large collections of post office documents. I showed you the ledger that we got as part of the Alexander collection earlier. Um, so we have two collections from post offices. One is from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, Chet Smith, who some of you may know, uh, helped bring that to the ADRL. He, he was after this guy who was sitting on it out in Aaronsburg for years. You know, you got to find a better home for this. you got to find a better home for this. And I guess he finally wore him down and <coughs> brought him to the ADRL. <coughs> and then uh, David Strait made uh, a complete index. Um, and David Strait was very excited for anything postal forms. We sat him down with two big boxes of these post office documents, and he sat there with a laptop and, and did an index of every form of the collection. So we have a very nice finding out and inventory for this collection. Um, and if you tour the Hedgeville Post Office while you're here this week, you'll see some of the ledgers from the Aaronsburg Post Office on display in there. Um, and then I contacted the Penns Valley Historical Society, and they were able to send me some pictures of the post office and general store in Aaronsburg. Um, so that, you probably can't read it, but that little sign does say post office. And we have <coughs> Excuse me. Pictures of this. Um, there, I guess it was a little bit later. There were gas pumps out the front, and some of the pictures it doesn't say post office; it just says general store. But I picked this one because it actually says post office on the building. Um, the other collection we have is from the Milford, Iowa post office, um, and Don Heller used David Strait's finding aid as a temp template, and again. Uh, sat down in the library with a laptop and made an inventory for us of that collection. So both of, both of these post office collections are very well indexed. So if you're looking for an example of a postal form, you can go through the inventory and see whether it's there. Um, another collection that we have um, is the APS APRL archives. So these are the archives of the society and of the library. <clears throat> and of course they go back to 1886 are still growing. Um, we have, you know, some periods we have less material than others, but, you know, as people go through their offices or, you know, donations come in to us from members, we find material to add to these collections. So they're uh, also another constantly evolving and growing collection. Um, we have published inventories. We had an intern this two summers ago, um, a local 
she lived in Belmont. Um, she ended up going to library school in North Carolina, uh, but she came in in the summer and did an internship with us. And her big project was going through the APS archives and inventorying some of the boxes. <clears throat> they had been roughly sorted by decade, and some of them had been roughly sorted by department. So you know, shows, sales, library. Um, but she went through it and created actually pretty detailed inventories, uh, which were published in the Philatelic Literature Review. Um, over the course of so quite, quite a few issues, actually. I think we went up to the 1970s, and then we decided from the 80s on the collections were just in too much flux to actually sit down and create an inventory and publish it yet. Um, <clears throat> this, this photo here is from a 1959 uh, convention banquet. Um, this is one that Eric Jackson donated to us, and we put it up on the website to try to identify some of the people in this picture because we thought, you know, we're getting to the end of the time when somebody might actually be able to look at this and recognize people. So we were able to identify a few more, you know, Eric was able to identify some and then we identified a few more. Um, but these, um, if anyone's ever seen these convention photos that they did back in these days, they're huge. They're like panoramic photos. You know, now you can do that on your iPhone, but these are big photo prints. Um, so if anyone was on the tour yesterday, you saw the uh, map and large document room. We have a flat file that has drawers you can pull out. So these convention photos are in one of the drawers up there. So it's really nice to be able to have some place where we can properly store these photos. Because a lot of them are stored or old and they're starting to you know, unfold and then they start to crack. So it's nice to be able to keep them flat. <clears throat> this is from the earlier part of the APS archives. This is a, um, I think this is a receipt for payment of dues, um, but it's dated 1898. Um, so this is an example where we do have philatelic material because this is the actual postal card. Um, this is from the 1920s. So we have the 40th annual convention in New York City. That's the official program. Um, and it's interesting going through these programs. You know, we have uh, menus for the banquets. We have invitations to receptions. Um, and a lot of the menus <coughs> would have a philatelic theme. So all, you know, all the courses of the dinner would be described in philatelic terms. So you, know, you would have perforated lettuce salad. <laughs> and some of them don't sound very appetizing to me. There's you know, some jello bowls and things like that in there. <laughs> um, and then we have this pamphlet, Jim Jones Joins. Um, Obviously, quite different from today's marketing. <laughs> and this is from the 1970s. Um, so this is dedication of the New American Philatelic Building and the American Philatelic Research Library. Um, and an article from the Center, Dem Center Democratic, which is that now the Center Daily Times? That we knew about. <laughs> Um, but anyway, this is the, the major newspaper in the area back then. So again, you can probably go up to the Center County Library, and they probably have this newspaper either in digital format or microfilm, and you can dig through and find it, but you know, you have to guess what day the article was actually published in the newspaper. Um, so it's really nice that we have this right in the archives, and we can see what the coverage was in the, in the local press. Um, this is our, our newest specialized library. And again, this is an actual cover that's in the archives. Um, a lot of these, you know, we would open up the boxes and we would find like 25 or 50 covers. Obviously, they didn't manage to hand them all out on dedication day. Um, so uh, the general practice in archives is to keep, if you have multiple copies, to keep up to three. So you have a preservation copy, you have a use copy, and you have a display copy. Um, so if, anywhere that we found, multiples of things, um, we would keep, we would select the best three, keep those, and then the rest we've uh, sold in the library or used as giveaways at events. And these are the clipping files. So this is another collection that was pre-existing. Um, this is another huge collection. It's um, several sides of rows of shells upstairs. And basically what a clipping file is, it's a file that has, it can be um, clippings of articles, photocopies of articles. Um, sometimes there are things in there like posters, brochures, uh, flyers, um, uh, various things. Um, but the, the bulk of it is actual uh, clipping.
mix of articles, sometimes there's correspondence. <clears throat> so the major parts of the clipping files, um, we have the earnest care files, which are huge. Um, they cover the world, um, very broad ranging. Um, the biggest the biggest sections are what care himself collected, so airmail, Switzerland, the Philippines, and Egypt. Um, but you'd be hard pressed to find an area of the world or a topic in philately that doesn't at least have a little thin folder in this collection. Um, so this is the the staff in the library will, will go to this, you know, we can't find any articles, we can't find any books, um, we can't find anything in our usual sources, we search online, can't find anything. Let's go see if CARE has anything on this country. Um, her, the Harlan Stone, this was actually acquired recently. Harlan donated his research files to the APRL. Um, and um, Michael actually did this. Um, he was in a, a funded uh, career program, which is how we first got to know him. So we got to kind of try him out for free. Um, his, his work here was funded through CareerLink. Um, so this was his first project, was organizing the Harlem Stone papers, so putting them in folders and labeling them and get, getting them on the shelves. Um, and this collection is exclusively Switzerland, so it's a lot more contained. Um, so if you're interested in Switzerland, we've got lots of stuff up there for you. Um, and then the other part is the U.S. stamp files, um, which is also a very large collection. The majority of it is organized by Scott Member, um, so it's uh, U.S stamps, um, the bulk of it is probably the first half of the 20th century, that's where it's strongest, um, but APRL staff have added to it, especially with more recent issues, and there are earlier issues represented up there as well. Um, and we worked with Richard Nagels on a collection of first day ceremony programs, um, so you will find a lot of So this is another place where you will find actual philatelic material, um, because we have programs, um, we have first day covers, um, and the, the majority of it is uh, Belmont Ferries, um, who was a journalist and also on the um, Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee. Um, John Stark was very interested in luminescence, so that's what a lot of his notes are about, um, and Forrest Ellis. I thought I had more images from these, but I guess I ran out of time scanning. Um, but you can see there are a lot of um, this. The image up here is from the Belmont Ferries files. Um, and you can see that there are a lot of images of proposed stamp designs. So if you're looking um, at the process of selecting a design for a stamp, this is a gold mine. Um, he's got lots of correspondence with people. Um, if there was a controversy about the uh, first day ceremony location or the uh, image of the stamp or the topic of the stamp, he generally has a lot of notes about that. Um, and he'll have a lot of the articles that appear in the philatelic press, but also in the non-philatelic press, um, and any big events that were associated with the stamp. Um, so if you're interested, there was, if there was an organization that was really pushing for a stamp, chances are you would have material on that. Um, so I, I think this is a really fun collection to go through. Um, and if anyone's interested in taking a look at any of these files while you're here this week, if you have a little bit of free time, um, you know, you're interested in you know, something from the stamp files or the clipping files which they have you bring down in the folder for you and you can use it in the library. Um, none of the material that I've talked about this morning circulates through the mail um, and that's because for the most part it's unique. Um, if we lose a book in the mail it's not good um, and sometimes it's difficult to replace but we can replace it. If we lose something from one of these files it's gone, it's the only one. Um, and I know a lot of people have asked about digitizing these collections. Um, there are a lot of problems with it um, from logistical. I mean, you can just see the variety of, of material and condition of material that's in these folders. Um, there's the extent of the material, um, just the, the sheer volume of it, and then the fact that a lot of it would still be under copyright. Um, and it would be very difficult to get permission for all of those things. I mean, obviously, that New York Times article is under copyright. Uh, New York Times has um, been in been in the courts um, protecting that copyright, and authors have been in the courts fighting for their rights in the New York Times, so um, that's not really something that we can afford to get into. Um, but you know, it is something that we continue to think about. How can we make our archives more accessible? And when we get a collection, can we scan this? Can we make it available online? Um, because we know not everybody, you know, you guys are all lucky you're able to come to Belfont, but we know that not everybody is able to do that. Um, so we do our best to help you out from a distance. 
if you're interested in something, we'll get the folder, we'll bring it down, we'll throw it, um, we can scan or photocopy material for you. Question? Yes. Tara, how do those holdings on U.S. stamp files compare with the stamp design files of the National Postal Museum, Third Assistant Postmaster General? That's a good question. Um, I haven't used the files at the Smithsonian, so um, if, if anybody has used those files, they might better be able to answer that it's, question. As you described it, it sounds like some of the same type of material. That's yeah, I, they're similar collections. Okay. Tara, yeah. if, if any of us in the room have materials that we think might be of use to the library, and what, what could we do to prepare that material for your review or to send it to you to say, hey, here's a banker box full of research notes about X. I mean, are there ways that we should be organizing or thinking about it to make it easier on you? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, and like I said, it, you know, it's, it's really ideal for us when we can work with somebody, you know, who's still around and active um, rather than getting things after the fact because we can talk to you about, you know, how things are organized, what kinds of material are in the, the collection. Um, and it, I'm actually working with the Classic Society to prepare a presentation um, that we could give, you know, maybe in Stamshow or other places, um, and maybe um, also put up online, talking about that, you know, how best to organize your collection for your own use, but also to prepare it um, so that it can live on and be of use to others after you're done with it. So, yeah, so not an easy answer, but um, if anybody would like to talk more about that, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Uh, Tara? Are you suitably impressed by the volume and the amount of scholarship? A few years ago, one of our top scholars, Ken Lawrence, went out to the ANA uh, library out in Colorado. They're our sister organization. They have a lot more money than we can ever hope to have. But uh, he told me, you know, Keith, uh, their library could fit into maybe a tenth of the size of our library over there. There's so much less scholarship. So this is one of the things that's impressed me over the years. The amount of people who take this so seriously that you're probably going to have to expand whatever we have right now in another five or ten years. So I consider you to be pretty lucky that you can see that this, uh, this hobby generates so much scholarship. Are you impressed by it? Absolutely, yeah. And I was impressed when I first visited the library before I worked here, um, and then you know, really impressed when I started working here and getting into the collection. And I tell my colleagues I have such a fantastic job because I work with so many people who are so passionate about doing research and learning, um, and most of you all are doing it as a hobby, so it's fun. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you.